All right, welcome everybody to Archive Dives with Oxen AI, where every week we dive into interesting research papers and try to tease out the key insights that you can apply to your own machine learning projects. If you're new here, welcome. The team at Oxen AI is building collaboration tools for iterating on machine learning data sets. Think of Git plus GitHub for data sets of hundreds of thousands of images, audio, video, text, the type of data that AI systems take in today. And while we do love building these open source tools, we also love staying up to date with the latest research to make sure we're building the right tools for the job for cutting edge research. And we also believe that quality data is the starting point for any machine learning project. So the more people that can contribute to the data, the better. Today's research paper has some really interesting properties and we'll dive into the data sets, but it's called self-rewarding language models and is from the teams at NYU and Meta. If anybody from those teams has joined the call, feel free to chime in at any point. Um, I saw there is some action when we posted it on Twitter and we haven't had somebody join live from the team yet, but we're, we're hoping you do. So if you're watching this asynchronously, we do this every Friday and let us know. Um, these sessions are live and open to the community. So if you want to join and you're watching this on YouTube, uh, the link's in the description, or you can go to oxen.ai slash community. And with that being said, I'll be sharing this Notion page so we can all follow along. Um, chime in with questions at any point. Ben's going to be monitoring the chat. And let's dive in. So today's paper is called Self-Rewarding Language Models by the team at Meta and some researchers at NYU. If you joined us last week at, or last Friday, uh, we did the paper on DPO and this, this paper kind of builds on DPO, um, but acknowledges that a lot of current language models are bottlenecked by labeled data from humans. Not only the quantity of labels is a bot bottleneck, but the quality of labels. And so these language models have a large pre-training step that they go through, but then once you start doing supervised fine tuning or pre preference tuning, you do need a labeled data set. So the goal of this paper is to see if we can create a self-improving feedback loop uh, to achieve superhuman agents. And if we're able to get the language model to learn how to reward itself in an iterative fashion, we may be able to escape the bottleneck of labeled data from humans. So that's a pretty cool idea in theory, and let's see how it works in practice. So in practice, what they are trying to do with this model is create an agent or an LLM that can both act as an instruction following model that we've seen over and over again from the instruct GPT paper, um, to a lot of the papers that followed where you can give it an instruction, a prompt, and it'll generate a response. But they also want the same model to be able to generate and evaluate a new instruction and add these examples back to its own training set. Um, and if they're able to do that, they can create this self-improving loop and see if the model improves over time. Uh, when thinking about this, I had some quick thoughts on synthetic data that I'd like to keep in the back of your mind as we go through it. Um, I am usually skeptical about synthetic data, data generation. This is because using data um, from a pre-trained model will not give us any new information that the model does not already have encoded in its parameters. That being said, in general, we're starting to see synthetic, synthetic data be a successful technique in papers like this. So I've been thinking on why this is the case and listening to other podcasts and, and research papers. And I think the best argument that I've heard so far is that with these large pre-trained language models, it's no longer about adding data from a new distribution distribution, since in theory, they've seen 
all the distributions on the internet. It's more about spiking the distribution in different directions um, so that you can have more control over the model and guide it on how to behave. So it's one thing to have a model that can, in theory, say anything. And it's another thing to have a model that says what you want it to say. So I feel like synthetic data data generation is really good for this second use case of trying to align the model or honing in specific skills. But I am a little skeptical about their superhuman level knowledge. And they even say in the paper that like, this is a great preliminary step to show that a model can improve over time. Um, I've just been thinking about how is that possible with syn synthetic data generation? I think there's still a lot of questions to be had there, and I would love to kind of dive into that after we see the details of the paper in the in the chat afterwards. So with that being said, let's dive into what a self-rewarding language model is. Um, if you've been following the archive dives so far, I think the entire pipeline pretty intuitive to wrap your head around. Um, and they have a nice diagram of it in the paper. So at the start, what we do is we have a model that generates new prompts. We use these prompts um, and train a seed model that can generate responses given the prompts. Uh, this model is just a instruction tuned model that can take in like instruction prompt and generate a variety of responses. Then we run it through the same model again, but this model has two skills. It's to both generate responses given a prompt and also generate rewards or rank the responses um, given the prompt. So this is the same model here as it is here then you use those rankings that came out of the model as preference pairs and feed that into a DPO um, training. If you remember DPO from last week, it's a replacement for RLHF, and it simply reformulates the problem into a classification problem. Um, and the classifications are between the preferred prompt or the pre preferred generation and a rejected generation. So they do that training process. They end up creating a new model, and they call that MT plus 1. So they start with M0, go to model 1, go to M2, M3. And then they'll take from M0, replace this model with M1, run the same process again, replace it with M2, run the same process again, and they show uh, in their studies that not only does the response generation get better, but the reward um, skill or mechanism also gets better. Uh, and they run this loop about three times, starting with Llama 70B, and show that it improves each one of those times, but they kind of stop after three. Um, and I don't know if that's due to computational limits or just this is a preliminary study and they're kind of leaving it open for other people to dive into. So, uh, like I said, they break this process down into two skills that they want the model to have. And so the first skill is just following instructions and the second skill is acting like a judge of outputs. So the first skill we probably all know and love if you've been uh, keeping up with language models, it's the skill from instruct, DP, instruct GPT um, and you use supervised fine tuning to get the model to follow instructions in a format similar to this where you're gonna have an instruction and the instruction might be make sure to output all data in JSON in the format of uh, JSON string. I want to make this just pure text. Uh, I'll just do YAML. 
Uh, so you can have an instruction here. Then you can have a prompt, like what does the team at oxen.ai do? And then you can have a response. Um, and hopefully the response is in JSON. And the cool thing about kind of separating out instructions from prompts is you could have the same question, but you want it formatted in a bunch of different ways, or you want the instruction to be like, reply in a in the voice of a pirate or like write it in Shakespeare. Um, so kind of separating out the instructions from the actual user prompts is a nice way to build an interface like ChatGPT, um, where you can have multiple different behaviors for the same model. So that's kind of what instruction tuning is and the first skill that we want to treat, train the model to do. The second skill is what they call LLM as a judge. So typically the second step after instruction fine tuning, which we went over last week in DPO, is uh, to further refine the model to align it to human preferences, or in this case, just preferences in general. Uh, and so techniques like DPO and RLHF have been shown to improve the language models further than just simple instruction fine tuning. So again, what this looks like is you take a prompt and a pair of outputs that the model generated. So these models, you can either change the temperature or change uh, how they generate their response. And then what you want is somebody to rank which response is better. Um, so again, if we had a prompt or the startup sentence that is Oxen AI is, we would have somebody label positive, fast and easy to use and negative a tool for helping farmers with their crops. Um, and so this allows the model to generate some options given the instruction fine tuning step and then to have a human in the loop, or in this case, they're just going to have their model in the loop ranking, which one is better. Hey, Greg, we had a chat question. Uh, what's the reward model exactly? How much contribution to better output is distributed between DPO versus the contributions of the reward model? And then how do you optimize ultimately selecting which reward pair? Yeah. So if we go back up to this diagram right here, what's really cool in this uh implementation is the reward model is the same as the llm that you trained for instruction fine tuning and you just add a new set of data to the data set that is the reward modeling data and we'll show you what that looks like um, and then dpo is just the algorithm um oh i guess the second part of the question was how do you pick the responses that go into the reward model We'll get into that a little farther in the paper, but then DPO is just the algorithm to take that and optimize it further. So Could we'll I show you a question. Yeah, go for it. Um, is it a um, encoder only, decoder only, or encoder decoder model? This is a decoder only, so it's like a GPT. Gotcha. Model. Okay. Yeah. So it's like you're you're started with you give it a prompt, and then it kind of has to complete from there. So left to right. Yep. Totally. Yeah. I was just thinking for the, the second step, you might consider a bi-directional model, but, but I mean, left to right seems to be all the rage. Yeah, totally. I think there's a lot of room to play within the actual architectures here, but this general framework is pretty cool. Thanks. Yeah. Bro. Um, so how do they do the reward model and what does LLM as a judge mean? Um, this is one of the ways that I mentioned before that they're spiking the distribution in a direction that they want. Um, and so in the paper, they show this big old prompt, um, that is acting as the reward model. So it says review the user's question and the corresponding response using the additive five point scoring system described below. Points are accumulated based on the satisfaction of each criterion, and then they list five different criterion. They then put in the user instruction here or the user prompt here, and then they put the response that the LLM generated here. 
Um, after examining the user's instruction and response, briefly justify your total score in up to 100 words. Conclude with the score using the format score total points. Remember to assess from the AI assistant perspective, blah, blah, blah. So this is kind of what the reward model is. It's just simply a prompt so that the same model can act as both the instruction following model and the reward model itself. Um, and this is actually not the first time that a technique like this has been proposed. Uh, there's a paper called Judging uh, LLM as a Judge with MT Bench and Chatterina. Um, and they say, and what they do in these papers is they actually have GPT-4 be the judge uh, rather than the model itself be the judge. Um, and so they say that strong LLM judges like GPT-4 can match both controlled and crowdsourced human preferences well, achieving over 80% agreement, the same level of agreement as between humans. Um, and so the big difference in this paper is they're not using an external model to be the judge and create the DPO data set, but they're using the model that they're training for instruction fine tuning uh, or instruction following to be the judge as well. So this means not only can it improve for instruction following, but it can improve uh, as being the judge as well, where, where these other papers have like a static GPT-4 or Claude 2 kind of being the judge. So that's the main difference in this paper. Um, and I think a few interesting things to note here. Um, well, well, we'll dive into those after we see the full pipeline. So how do they initialize this whole loop? So they start by giving a seed set of instructions that they use to supervise fine tune a lava or a llama 70B model. This is a really small data set that they start with. There's only 3,200 examples from all in English that are high quality. Um, and they're actually originally grabbed from this data set called uh, Open Assistant. And so we had one of our team members here reproduce some of the work that they did since they didn't open source the data sets themselves. Um, and just to give you a sense of what this initial instruction following data set would look like, um, you basically have a prompt like what is Aristotelian view of physics and Pettus and stuff wrong? And then it has a response text um, elaborating on that. And they only start with 3,200 examples um, with a bunch of different prompts and responses, which is a pretty small data set to get started with. What was really cool about the Open Assistant data set is they gave a quality score to all of the um, prompts and responses. So in this paper, they took that quality score, sorted by the highest quality, and took 3,200 examples as the starting point. They call this data set the IFT data set, um, instruction fine tune data set. So if you see in the paper IFT, it's just instruction fine tune, like prompt and response kind of data. Um, and then they create a second data set, which they call the EFT, Evaluation Fine Tune Data Set. And this data set uh, is prompts that don't overlap with the instruction fine tune data set, but in the format of LLM as a judge prompt. And they said they used uh, like 1700 training and 500 evaluation. And so with that data set, looks like we also put it up in here, um, is you have multiple prompts with different responses. Um, so in this case, what are codes and conventions in the media 
and it has this very high quality response. And then you also have the same prompt, what are codes and conventions in the media with a response text of something that you wouldn't want, like, huh? And then that has a quality score of zero. Um, so you can see there's a, uh, a relationship here of you have one prompt with many different continuations with different quality scores that come out the end. So that's what they call the evaluation uh, fine tune data set. And these are the two data sets that they're going to be building up on and accumulating over time as they're retraining the model. Yeah, may I add something? Yeah. Go for it. So in their paper, what they did is they had the LLM write a like uh, justification and then a score. And uh, I did not have the resources to do that myself. But if anyone wanted to replicate this, they would have to. Yeah, they'd have to basically go and uh, go and implement that from scratch. Right. So we, so for one, uh, Eric was the one that did all this nice work of like cleaning up this data. And for two, we just took the data from, uh, the open assistant data set rather than generating data from the model itself. That'd be a clear description, Eric. Yeah, I agree with that. Cool. Um, so those are the two data sets we're working with. They mix these two data sets together to start um, to train the initial supervised fine tune model. And the idea here is the IFT half of the data um, trains it to follow instructions. And then the EFT half of the data trains it to be a judge. Um, so they kind of just mix those together and get their initial model M0. After they have their initial model, they go through this self-instruction creation method. So this is where the model itself is modifying its own training set. And they do this uh, in three steps. So pretty straightforward if you were following that diagram before. First, they generate a new prompt given view shot prompting. So they're actually using a model itself to generate what the new prompts should be. Um, then they generate N candidate responses given each prompt. They evaluate the candidate responses using the LLM as a judge skill um, of the same Instructune model. And then they kind of get a ranking out of all of the N candidate responses. And they have two ways that they add this to the data set itself. Um, so they also say once they add it to the training data set, they call this AIFT data. So it's a lot of, it goes from I, IFT to EFT to AIFT. Um, and when they're doing this, they have two methods that they experiment with. The first one is just taking high and low pairs. So given a prompt X and responses Y, I, they take the highest ranked one out of the model uh, and the lowest ranked one and create a preference pair of that that they're going to feed into DPO. If they rank the same, they just toss it out and don't use it. Um, and then they also experimented with positive examples only. So given a prompt X, uh, they take the responses with only a perfect score of five from the evaluator and add that back into the instruction following data set. They said that they found that this first, first method worked way better than just adding the positive examples back in. And they have some numbers at the end of the paper to show that. Um, and then, like I said before, this is an iterative training process. So they train a series of models. And uh, so they start with M0, which is a pre-trained LLM with no fine tuning. In this case, it's Llama 70B. They initialize with M0, then fine tune on just the IFT 
and EFT seed data. So that's only um, like five to 6,000 examples from that open assistant data set. Then they take M1, which was trained with that seed data. Uh, they initialize M2 with it, and then they generate the AIFT data from M1, optimize M1 with DPO, and then do the same thing over and over again um, until they get M3. So I guess just over again once. Um, and they say that this procedure represents a similar flow to some previous work like pairwise cringe optimization and iterative DPO papers. However, the key difference is the reward model in this case is changing each time since it is just the same model that we're using to generate responses and rank responses um, where other pipelines don't update that reward model. Can you talk a little bit about like cringe optimization and cringe loss? Because it, it sounds hilarious, but I'm sure it is much more serious and legitimate than that. <laughs> you know, I didn't actually read the cringe optimization paper. I thought I'd okay. put it put it in here uh, just because it does have a great name. I feel like it, if I were to guess, this is just a shot in the dark, but like you're just trying to have it not say cringy things. And I hope Got that's it. what it is. <laughs> I love that. <laughs> Um, cool. So then for the evaluation, they evaluate the model on two axes. So its ability to follow instructions and its ability to evaluate its own responses. Um, and so for instruction following evaluation, they use GPT-4 to evaluate the performance of their various models. And then they use this Alpaca eval framework, um, which is open source and has a bunch of uh, eval tools. I'll link to it here if you want to learn more. And then for the reward modeling half of the evaluation, they evaluate the correlation with the humans human rankings on the evaluation set from the open assistant data set. Um, so in the open assistant data set, these quality scores we're given from humans, and then we're going to get quality scores out uh, from the model. And they say that on average, uh, each instruction they evaluate with on average 2.85 responses. And so that gives some rankings. And then they compute a pairwise accuracy showing the model the two responses and seeing if the ranking from the reward model lines up with the, the human ranking and if it does line up like you put this response over that response then they just compute accuracy from that so those are the two uh, evaluation methods and we'll dive into some of the results so um they show that the iteration uh, to M1 with the EFT plus IFT data set initially. So they do this experiment at the start where they just like leave out the EFT data set and just do the IFT data set. And they say that uh, adding in the EFT doesn't impact the performance of the IFT at all, which is a great first step. They, they don't want it to lose the ability to follow instructions um, just because they added this EFT data. And so that's what this first bar is showing is um, the supervised fine-tuned base versus the M1 where they put EFT plus IFT data. They both win about the same amount of time. And then once they go through and add the data that's generated from the model, um, the self-rewarding M1 uh, does way better than the supervised fine-tuned baseline. And then once they do it for M3, it improves again. Um, and given GPT-4 judging these responses, GPT-4 says M2 wins 49% of the time, and then M3 wins 62% of the time, it's a tie 27% of the time, and then the supervised fine-tuned bottle 
wins 9% of the time. So that's kind of how they do the evaluation of is the model improving? Um, and I actually don't remember what this bottom graph is doing, but, oh, I guess it's, it's comparing, sorry, it's comparing M1 versus M3, M2 versus M1, and M2 versus M3 versus this first one is just comparing to that supervised fine-tune baseline. So even when comparing um, M2 to M3, M2 or M3 wins against M2. So it's just different ways of slicing and dicing who you're comparing to what. Um, and like I said, they used GPT-4 as the evaluator. And so they wanted to do this against other models, not just itself to see how this um, self-improving mechanism might rank to compared to models that may have been fine-tuned and trained on like millions of examples. Um, for example, any of these models kind of at the top of the leaderboard. And so what these numbers are is the win rate uh, against GPT-4 Turbo evaluated by GPT-4. <laughs> um, and so at the time of the paper, models like Mistral, Medium, and Claude 2 beat GPT-4 Turbo like 17% of the time or 21% of the time. And this method of starting with only those uh, like 5,000 examples goes from 9% win rate over GPT-4 to 15 to 20. And now all of a sudden it's kind of in the top of this leaderboard here. Um, which is pretty impressive considering uh, the models that are at the top of the leaderboard are either trained from, some of them have over a million annotations in their training set, or they use targets distilled from stronger models to like generate the data set, where this one is using the model itself to generate that data set. So um, it has this like self-improving mechanism. So I would say that's oh. like the big takeaway. Oh, go ahead, Ben. Sorry, Paul had a question in the chat that I have been wondering as well, and that we talked about briefly in the chat earlier, which is, did they explicitly mention like why three? I know somebody said maybe it's <laughs> three after that, or was it more of like a compute uh, cost scenario? They didn't say why three, but they said that this is like a preliminary study and they just wanted to get results out to show that this is possible. I think right. that's... <laughs> totally something people can play with and like yeah. i would love to see a chart of when it stops because my yeah. intuition is going to be that it stops but could be wrong okay. um and so that's just this is just how well these numbers are just how well the model follows instructions um so asking gpt4 how well did it follow <laughs> the instruction given the prompt um but they also look at the model's ability to rank the preferred outputs. Um, and so they did that pairwise accuracy that I talked about before. And so you can see the IFT baseline has a pairwise accuracy um, given the human judgments of those same pairs of 65%. And then when they add in the IFT plus EFT data, that goes to 78%. Then when they do the uh, AI generated data and put that back in, it goes to 81%. And then when they do it again, it goes to, or sorry, 80% then 81%. Um, so it's interesting that the reward, the, the ability of the model to look back on itself and rank these is also improving over time as it's generating more data. Um, I think the biggest thing to note here, and it was kind of just like a one liner in the paper, is that the quality of the LLM as a judge prompt can have a huge impact on the overall pipeline. So they said that they started with uh, this prompt from a paper called Self Alignment with Instruction Back Translation. Um, and 
the prompt from this paper got 26% accuracy <laughs> for this first step. And the prompt from their paper or from this paper got 61% accuracy. And they show the other prompt at the end of the paper. And it is a big prompt and it has a bunch of things in there, but like simply changing how you formulate what you want the model to look for in that prompt gives you a huge boost in, in the starting point. And I almost feel like this is uh, the most interesting part of the paper, because if you think about it, um, I, I wrote some notes on this in a different section here, but um, the few key things are they start uh, with an initial model that can already generate reasonable responses. So like they're starting with a Llama 70B model that's already pretty good. Um, and the reward model must also be really good to kick off this process at all. Otherwise you'd be like generating garbage, ranking garbage and feeding garbage back into the model. Um, so I, I think the reason that this works really well now is we have these base models that work uh, good out of the gate. And I don't think this would have worked in the past if you just started with a, a model that from scratch or whatever, you kind of have to start with this model that has a reasonable amount of skills and then it can build upon those skills and you're really guiding it with this prompt right here um, or this, uh, this prompt right here. So this is kind of, if you're going to experiment, I feel like this is a really high bang for your buck place to do it. Um, but overall, I feel like the paper was pretty simple and easy to grok if you know what supervised fine tuning is and you know what DPO is. Um, and I think the coolest parts of it are the size of the data set needed um, and that it does, and that if you start with these good models, it does kick off a virtuous cycle is what I meant to write there. Um, but it is only a preliminary study. I think some things that some obvious things that people could try next are one, we mentioned this in the chat, but why did we stop at three steps? Was it just a compute thing? Um, does the performance start to tail off there because you're just like saturating the data set with examples that it's already seen? I would love to see if this method would work on smaller models. Um, so if you weren't here at the beginning, we have one of our community members, Raul, starting to kick off some experiments, given the data that we put in Oxen to see if this would work with like Mistral 7B instruct as a starting point. Um, and then what other prompts could we use for the LLM as a judge step to direct the model in different directions, I think. And they even mentioned this in the paper that whatever the prompt is that you use here as imp implications for performance, but also safety, like they are saying, let's rank uh, safe responses and harmless responses higher. Um, in theory, somebody could change that LLM as, as a judge step to be ne more nefarious. <laughs> um, so that could be another reason um, they stopped at three steps was safety concerns. Um, but yeah, overall, pretty straightforward paper. Um, we'll turn off the recording here if we have any other questions or discussion we want to go over uh, as a group. If you want to join, oh yeah, thanks Ben for tossing all this in here as well. If you want to join us for the live session and you're watching this on YouTube, there's the link in the description or just go to oxen.ai slash community. Uh, we love the portion afterwards where we kind of dive in and in more detail and and chat as a group and hope to see you next week we'll be diving into the tool former paper next uh, which shows how you can teach llms to use tools to gain skills that um like using a calculator or looking up the weather or stuff like that that you might not be able to encode into the model parameters itself so 
looking forward to that. And with that said, I'll kill the recording uh, and we'll go offline. Thanks, guys.